so I've just been told it's coming out day in Red Square, and this couldn't be more appropriate because the gender justice initiative is out. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all for coming. And um, we're from the three campuses. We're going to each say a few words. But first, together, we're going to announce some very big news. Go for it. Go for it, Denise. You're, hold, you're, you're holding the microphone. <laughs> um, we have received word that we have three years of funding to build this gender justice initiative. So from there, we'll, we're each going to say a few words. I'm from the main campus. I'm Denise Brennan. I'm chair of the Department of Anthropology. Um, so we've been uh, building this across the three campuses. So what does that mean? The law center and the medical center? We think it's really the only space that has um, generated a set of intellectual conversations um, that brings people together across those campuses that really focuses on our intellectual work, our scholarship. Um, otherwise, we're rarely around tables together, and it's usually about administration. So we find this to be thrilling, very fertile ground. Um, we have had a series of ongoing small group conversations, and we've had events, and this is our second an annual colloquium. The purpose of the colloquium every fall will be to lift up and celebrate the dynamic um, gender justice scholarship that's already going on across the three campuses. Um, I do. I, I can't resist also noting that um, our undergrads on the main campus have submitted a proposal to build out a women and gender studies department. And we have been barraged with the headlines this week of brutal, um, unacceptable uh, gender violence in one of the biggest industries that dominates the world. Um, this in, this initiative is, is long overdue, um, and my colleagues will, will, are going to try to rally you to, to think about um, this place as a home, a place that you can bring ideas, a place that you can build things, um, and we're just, we're thrilled you're here, and we're thrilled for the work that's ahead. <laughs> I'm next. Um, hi, everyone. We really are... Um, beyond excited that we have the support of the three executive vice presidents from the three campuses to launch this. It's going to be a trial run, a pilot program, basically. So we have three years to make this into the place we want it to be. And as Denise said, that involves figuring out what we need, what we need as uh, teachers and scholars, what we need as graduate students, what we need as undergraduate students, and, and what we need as staff as well. And to that end, I hope that as you think about the roles that uh, the Gender Justice Initiative can serve, that you will let us know, because we are still in that building phase, and we will be in that building phase for a couple of years. We've been working for two years to get here, um, and now we actually have the resources to really make it happen. So we now have an email that's genderjustice at georgetown.edu. As you think about the roles that this initiative can serve, please email us and just let us know like what you need, what what you think this would best be. And we have ideas ourselves based on what we've been doing for the last two years. We've been holding student faculty mixers at the individual campuses. We had um, co-sponsored a conference on uh, campus violence at the Law Center. We did a, we co-sponsored an event with the theater department. And it was, there are wonderful collaborations that we can do, but and going forward, we want to be able to highlight books and um, important research that the faculty is doing. But again, partly because the unique way in which this is a cross-campus initiative, partly it's being able to get to know each other and get to know each other's work. That feels so crucial to me, being across campus at the Law Center. So I'm 
just totally thrilled that we're real <laughs> and that we're no longer a, like a fantasy of our own imaginations. And uh, we're really glad that you're here. Hi, my name is Christy Graves. I'm in the Department of Oncology uh, within the Medical Center and thrilled to collaborate with Maine Campus and Law and another one of our um, executive committee members, Dr. Katherine Sandberg from the Medical Center and, and Ann Hunter and Lisa Krim. So we have a um, powerhouse in terms of some of the ideas that have been shared. But now is the time when we can turn to our communities and really find out what we need to do to move gender justice forward at Georgetown. And so it's through those collaborative efforts and cross-campus dialogues that I think that will happen. We've had a number of initiatives at the medical center to start to look at these issues, but not in the same way. And so we're really thrilled to be able to partner with all of you and across the three campuses for this. So let me explain how the day is going to go. We decided that this is going to be kind of like an all-day cocktail party. <laughs> um, there will be food out there. <laughs> well, the cocktails are coming. The cocktails are coming at 5. But the idea is that this is a movable feast. Right. Um, so come and go as, as you go to meetings. Come back and join us at 5 o'clock, most certainly, for, for real cocktails and some really swanky food. Um, and, and anyone in the audience that has a book that they're launching, we want to be your book party. So with that, let me turn it over. Nan is going to kick us off and explain intersectionality. <laughs> <laughs> All right. No, no, uh, um, no easy task, right? Although, actually, it, um, in thinking about it, um, in some ways it turned out to be uh, easier than uh, I expected. And I would just perhaps summarize it this way. I think the subtitle for my talk is that all you ever really need to know, um, you can learn from black feminism. Um, <laughs> and and that's, that's sort of pretty much where this goes. I want to add my thank yous to those already expressed to the leadership of the university. Uh, not just for this event, but for the support that has been announced and for the exciting kinds of things that we expect to do across our campuses going forward. I'm going to talk about intersectionality. I'm going to talk about it a bit from my perspective as a law professor, um, in part because the concept itself emerged from a law review article, um, but also because one of the projects that I'm engaged in now is um, a, a kind of interrogation of the civil rights paradigm and what um, the events of the last several decades in various social movements across the spectrum have taught us about the meaning of the civil rights paradigm, the power of it, the shortcomings of it, um, and the kinds of lessons that uh, we can learn uh, going forward. And I think the concept of intersectionality, and I'm going to just elaborate on it a bit, um, can be quite useful as a prism for engaging in that, uh, in that questioning. So um, in about a month from now, um, the annual conference of the National Women's Studies Association uh, is organized around a celebration and commemoration of the Kambahi River Statement. Um, a document, a manifesto issued in 1974 by a group of African-American feminists. And that statement, um, I think, is so profoundly generative, not only of the various aspects of intersectionality, but of the kinds of dimensions and still the tensions uh, within which social movement politics uh, operates. Um, the, the terminology, if you will, I think, of intersectionality can be traced uh, to that statement uh, and to its um, analysis of interlocking uh, forms of oppression. The term intersectionality itself first came into the scholarly literature in uh, two articles in 1989 and 1991 by uh, law professor Kimberly Crenshaw. Um, and Professor Crenshaw was analyzing the law of discrimination and 
the ways in which the legal system protected or did not protect victims of violence. And she originally came to intersectionality, as she herself has described, in a way that might one might think of as sort of the, the sort of um, kind of clearest uh, meaning of it. That is, the idea of intersectional as multiple, multiple vectors of marginalization. The idea that women of color, for example, um, could lose a discrimination suit and did lose some employment uh, discrimination suits and still an issue with which the courts are wrestling and they have not figured out how to deal with this properly. But if an employer could say, well, look, I hire, you know, African Americans and I hire women, so, you know, I've got no record of discrimination. And yet, a combination of particular social, political, cultural characteristics um, made um, women of color and, and uh, particular races or ethnicities um, vulnerable um, in ways that the law could not, still struggles, to capture in terms of providing any effective remedy seemed, I think, like such a powerful metaphor for the ways in which society as a whole can overlook multiple vectors of oppression or subordination with a simple-minded anti-discrimination approach or what we might think of as the tr traditional um, civil rights approach. I think we can add to that the idea of compounded intersectionality or compounded marginalization. That is, it isn't just that um, a woman of color may suffer discrimination as a person of color because of her race and as a woman, but that these two vectors compound each other, that they make each other worse, and in fact they generate new particular um, uh, episodes and moments um, and vectors of discrimination that are actually quite particular. And the third aspect of it I would suggest that has grown out of um, Professor Crenshaw's uh, incredibly generative uh, concept of intersectionality is the idea of embedded intersectionality. Not just that someone in a particular position can suffer sort of multiple vectors, not just that those vectors reinforce each other, but that those vectors create and generate new structures, structures of oppression that themselves become embedded in a structural and systemic way. And I think that um, when we, uh, uh, who have been working with the Gender Justice Initiative here at Georgetown, when we, we talk about how we want this to be an intersectional um, project. Um, we um, want to speak to all of those aspects of intersectionality in the way that we look at uh, gender justice. And to do so in the tradition of the Kambahi River um, uh, statement, which spoke about not only interlocking uh, oppression, but also about specification and identity and a new politics. And I think what the, the mixture of those pieces, which you also see reflected in the work of uh, Professor Crenshaw, which you also see reflected in the work of uh, Professor Kathy Cohen, who's a political scientist, also um, African-American feminist, and what you see today in the Black Lives Matter movement uh, led by African-American feminist uh, and created uh, by African-American feminist um, is a recognition that both the specification, the specificity, um, or the identity politics, if you want to use that term, and the interlocking embedded nature of structural discrimination both have to be recognized and um, understood uh, and carried forward. And that's what, that's what I mean, at least, by um, a politics of intersectionality, that it isn't just a recognition that for some individuals the, the mechanisms of oppression are compounded or um, are multiple or compounded and even embedded, 
Um, but that that recognition produces a critique, a particular radical and critical um, position with regard to those structures of oppression um, that indeed um, one can share or not share particular aspects of identity um, and join in that critique. So um, the, the politics, which is where I, I hope this would um, would leave us, uh, I think is reflective, well, I won't say reflective, I think probably more generative of other kinds of um, developments that we've seen in other um, uh, rights movements and other sort of civil rights movements. So I'm reminded to just take a quick example of the word queer. The word queer can mean that you're gay um, it has um, uh, been used to mean, to indicate a sort of anti-assimilationist militancy. I'm not just, I don't just call myself gay, I call myself queer because that's like a, you know, a sort of impolite word and sort of in your face and so it's a statement of militancy. Um, it can be a statement of a queerness that encompasses more than just gay or lesbian and more than just gay, lesbian, bisexual or transgender. It can incorporate um, and can be claimed by um, anyone whose sexual practices somehow fall outside what, uh, what has become a more capacious version of normativity and respectability, especially now with marriage, but which still we need to be reminded leaves some people outside. And lastly, it can be a political critique, a position, a sort of queer critique of certain ideas and of certain structures that indeed is not dependent on one's uh, particular sexual identity or sexual practice. So those are my thoughts about intersectionality. I hope people find those uh, helpful. Um, that's the way that I think about uh, the difference between a traditional civil rights approach and an intersectional approach. And I think the, the concept and the progeny, if you will, of intersectionality leaves us both with um, intellectual and political projects that are um, important to, um, to the issues that we care about um, and indeed to this very university. Thank you. Thank you for that eloquent uh, description and beginning. Uh, to set the stage in terms of intersectionality. We'll have our um, remaining panelists introduce themselves, share their department and their school, and then each individual will have 10 minutes. We'll hold all questions until the end, and then we have time for questions and answers of all of our panelists. Cool. So this is me. Um, these days I divide my research time between philosophy of language and radical politics. And sometimes I give 10-minute presentations on 30-page papers on both. So I'm going to go fast, and there'll be no arguments. Um, OK, so here's the scene. You're sitting in a bar. Uh, you happen to be sitting next to the woman up here who's Judith Polgar, a world-class chess player. You don't know that, though. You're just chatting. And in walks the other guy, Hikaru Nakamura. And he says, hey, that was a nice swindle you pulled off, sacking the knight to create Zugzwang. Now, I'm hoping that most of you don't know what that means which is the point. Um, I want to note a few things that Hikaru does just by making that assertion to that person in that context. First of all, he picks out Yudit as a person who's capable of understanding and responding and being part of this conversation. He expresses a kind of personal authority himself as a person worth speaking about this topic uh, and recognizes her authority. Uh, you, by doing that, by ignoring all the rest of y'all, he implicitly defines a sort of community of relevant speakers. He excludes all the people who don't know what these words mean because he uses a particular vocabulary, he draws upon a certain background history, chess theory, all of this sort of thing. And he sets a kind of conversational agenda. You might have been having a perfectly nice conversation about whatever, now the topic is this. Okay, what I want to imagine here is what it's like to be in a community in which that's a daily occurrence, <laughs> where that kind of outgroup 
structuring via, via speech acts is a daily lived experience. So imagine you live in an impoverished community, fit in a press demographic. There are going to be many people in the world who do things designed to help you, to support you. But in most cases, they, they do not speak to you, much less invite you to serve as spokesperson. They use language you're not familiar with, set agendas that are not always your own, and speak to people who have nothing in common with you. And among the people that do those things are academics. Um, I, and I mean the good ones, the well-meaning ones who are actually trying to help. Uh, and when academics do that, this is what I'm called the speaking for model of scholarship. This is just a picture. I don't know who this guy is, but it seemed like a good picture for that. Um, uh, that is to say, we who are not them speak to institutions that are not them in language that isn't theirs about our interpretation of their issues. Now, there's reasons for doing that. It's not all bad. We have a lot of access that people in, in, in various disempowered communities don't have. Fund, fund, uh, funders and NGOs and governments and the court system often will listen to things that we academics have to say in a way they won't listen to other people. So it's not like this is all bad. But at the same time, when we speak for people, uh, we reinscribe this uh, epistemic marginalization and to a certain extent further constitute these structural disempowerment features of their situation. Now, another model that, and all of this is seriously is developed, I'm not just saying things. Um, in the 90s and 2000s, I frequently got invited to give talks and lead educational events on behalf of communities I'm not a part of. I would protest, and I would be told that, well, we can't get the space or the funding or the audience without those magic three letters at the end of a name, so we really need you to do it. And my compromise was to always bring someone from the relevant community with me. And this is better, because then that person gets to express views to this audience that they wouldn't ordinarily be invited to. But at the same time, I think it's pretty clear that the background power dynamics and presuppositions and implicit biases and all that of the audience are going to be projected onto the speakers. I will, and I, I've got tons of instances I can detail about this, I'll be perceived as the um, kind senior person who's bringing the nice, young, not so serious person along with me. And it's incredibly hard to break out of that structure in that. So the sort of the central question I'm asking in all of this is how can we um, usefully shut up? And by useful, I mean, how do, how do we take our voices out of the discourse in a way that nonetheless still makes use of the kinds of skills and privileges and resources that we have access to? How can we bring all those, bring those benefits as much as possible without highlighting us as the speakers and the people we talk to as the listeners in all those kind of ways that academic discourse typically does? OK, so let's see if I can do this. Did that work? There. So for the last three years, um, I've been working with a project that was started by two educator activists in Ferguson called the Truth Telling Project. And we've been bringing uh, family members and friends of people killed by police to Ferguson, Missouri to give sort of informal testimony before a community of elders about their experiences and things like that. Um, we've also, here, very cool. Have I got, yep, I'm doing well. So I'm going to play just one. Is the sound going to work? It's important that we tell our stories and not leave it up to someone else because no one can tell our stories better than us. OK, I'll just stop with that. That's Corey Bush, who's one of the founders of the project, also a leader of Ferguson Frontline, spent like literally every day for a year out, out in the streets after Mike Brown was killed. She's also an ER nurse and all kinds of other cool things, running for Congress. Um, Send her money. Yeah, <laughs> seriously. No, I'm absolutely. Um, uh, so um, in addition to the testimonies, we um, have uh, last summer, we got together uh, with a group called the Babel Project that teaches folks to use filming techniques, gives, teaches people how to use cameras, how to use editing software, how to do all this. And so the sisters and friends of Mike Brown made a documentary. They 
after the end of like two months of training with this, all by themselves, they edited, produced, spoke in. So you can see this on this website, a 10 minute documentary about Mike's life by the peop young folks who knew him. Um, but the heart of all this is these, whoops, not that page, sorry, is, is um, are these testimonies. So you've got all these testimonies here um, by different folks. And I'm gonna just play two minutes of this one for no, chosen for no reason other than this is a former Georgetown student and friend of mine, uh, Brandon Anderson. Washington, D.C., thank you for coming out today, volunteering to do this. Go ahead and tell us your story. Yeah, um, so um, I'm originally from Oklahoma. I was recruited uh, from Oklahoma to join the military in 2003. And in 2003, uh, I was recruited. I served about uh, four years. In my fourth year uh, in the military, in the U.S. Army, um, my uh, lifetime partner was killed in Oklahoma by police. And uh, he was gunned down uh, because he fit a, um, a description of a suspect that later was caught. Um, but turned out that it wasn't him. Two officers, the two officers that um, that shot and killed him, uh, never stood trial. They uh, they weren't even indicted. So, uh, in an effort to in an effort to go and see my partner. Um, of seven years. I've been knowing him since I was 14 at that point. Um, we ran away together. Um, we got our GED together. We dropped out of high school together. Uh, we did good things too. Um, um, he started his first painting business. I started um, and I went into the military. And, and I think um, in, in, in a real effort, really, to kind of go see him, um, I, told, I told my commanding officer in the military about my sexual orientation. Uh, and, <clears throat> and my commanding officer told me to disarm, surrender my weapon and expect a dishonorable discharge by the end of the week. OK, so that goes on for a while. Um, the idea of this pedagogical resource we've been working on for three years is that community groups, churches, activist organizations uh, will show a film like this and then click on discussion and activity guide where they will get uh, additional questions, um, keywords, topics for discussion, uh, various extensions, um, lists of um, and an activity, a concrete activity for work in the community based around that topic, a list of extra resources. Um, and in addition to all of that, we have a structure of, of themes that relates all the different testimonies to the places they fit. And finally, uh, a range of both people who can go out and facilitate these kind of learning situations and local organizations that you can plug into to do actual concrete action around white supremacy. So I just thought I'd show you that that's the best I can, I've been able to do for a model of using our skills and resources while shutting up. Thank you. Can you make it go back? <laughs> I don't want to do it. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Rosemary N. Dubuizu, and I'm um, excited and to say that I'm a part of the newly formed Department of African American Studies. Thank you. And so I also just want to take this time to say thank you to Professor uh, Brennan for inviting me to be a part of this conversation today. So next year we'll mark the 20th anniversary of the federal government's overhaul of public housing and Section 8 assisted housing policy. This policy 
that was passed in 1998 enshrined the federal government's shift away from public housing and a shift towards privatized housing with the use of vouchers. Mm -hmm. But this policy also enshrined stricter ev eviction laws that made it easier for the federal government to deny and evict renters. And with the use of vouchers, the, increase, the federal government's increased reliance on vouchers, it has become harder for primarily low-income black women who have been disproportionately impacted by this policy change to find affordable housing in cities like DC, which incidentally my research focuses on. Today my talk focuses on how federal officials curated the illusion of black consent to this housing policy. Particularly, I'm interested in how federal officials used surrogates to get access to black, women's, black women who live in public housing's opinions on public housing reform. And more specifically, my research looks at how these federal officials who were overwhelmingly white men who were Republican but in alliance with the new Democrats that uh, our former president, Bill Clinton, was a, a primary leader for, curated this illusion of black consent through, I argue, black housing managers, particularly black men. During the congressional debates that led up to the passage of this federal housing reform that came to be known properly, properly known as Hope Six, Federal officials praised and centered the voices of black men and not the voices of black women who live in public housing. And it was through the voices of black men that these officials used to justify its punitive and conservative turn in housing policy. More specifically, these federal officials used black male housing officials, managers, and solicited their advice on how to implement tougher, strict, um, tougher procedures for eviction, but then also to attach housing assistance to um, disciplinary measures like case management. In, a, in order to understand how the federal government curated this uh, illusion of black consent, you, we must understand the history of um, interracial, intraracial, excuse me, and um, inter-class divisions within the black community. The federal officials exploited um, and selectively lifted up the voice of black male housing managers that spoke to a masculine version of racial uplift, but also black nationalism. And these federal officials used these black men and tokenized in many ways their voices to say that these black men were able to successfully implement on a local level the stricter housing policies that they wanted to see nationalized. So today, since um, I have a limited time, I'm gonna give two examples. And then in the Q&A, hopefully I can talk more about what black, the political perspectives of black women, how they were denied and how justice was denied, um, gender justice was denied. Because housing, in my opinion, um, is an example of gender justice. And until we recognize that low-income black women, particularly when activists, low-income black women, are demanding additional resources into public housing and not privatized housing, they're making a declaration on the state to add additional investments in a policy that they feel no longer exists or should no longer exist. So two examples I'm gonna talk about today. In the congressional hearings, there were two men that were given a great deal of attention and focus. One, his, the first one was the executive director for Omaha's Public Housing Authority. His name was Louis Armstrong, a black man, uh, black businessman who eventually earned uh, and won the seat to govern uh, public housing in Omaha. And in his congressional testimony, he talks about how deregulation and privatization freed him up to be able to implement the stricter policies that he believed were needed in order to get low income, primarily low income black women off public housing and into the privatized housing market. 
And he argued that in his, in Omaha, that he was able to pass um, stricter eviction policies that were, if you had loud parties, if you had people who were not in your house that uh, were on the lease, there was a slew of additional um, provisions that he was able to pass at a local level to mandate uh, swift evictions. And he also then talked about in his congressional testimony how he required that every resident, every head of the household had to submit to case management. So a social worker must come in to discuss with them how to attach them how to make sure that they're employed and attached to some type of job. Mind you, this is a time historically when um, low wage service jobs were oftentimes and still is very precarious. So attaching them to any type of job oftentimes meant low wage and non-unionized jobs. And so in his testimony, um, he stressed that he believed as, his, as the um, Omaha public housing director, that it was his responsibility to help poor black people see that they can help themselves and teach them how to, and he thought his role was to, as he said, teach them how to participate in the American process. This quote that I gave you an example of um, demonstrates his investment in a masculine version of racial uplift, which rises from the 20th century in response to black exclusion from American democracy and limited attachment to the um, American capitalism. And so as, a, um, as historian Kevin Gaines argued, as a compromise, many black middle class men and women, and oftentimes black elite, believe that it was the role of, it was the role of, an instrumental role of black people who were in this position of relative class privilege to demonstrate that American black people can earn the right to participate in American democracy and capitalism once they perform normativity based on patriarchy, accepting uh, wage work, and accepting um, hierarchies within the American society. And so I argue in Armstrong's application of racial uplift, he pursued self-sufficiency, which became a cornerstone in the federal housing policy law of 1998, was a contemporary extension of racial uplift's commitment to self-help. So in his work and in his congressional testimony, Armstrong stressed that it was important for him to demonstrate his leadership by helping to serve as a, almost a cultural or patriarchal intermediary for black women to help end their quote unquote dependence on public housing. As he mentioned, as he once mentioned, black people are not dark white people. There's a basic lack of understanding about black culture and black people. Racism and prejudice are luxuries of convenience. And I don't know if that will ever change. It won't in my lifetime. By Armstrong sharing this perspective that racism and prejudice will be um, a cornerstone of American society, he believed it was important for him to almost help broker a relationship between poor black people and Amer um, the white uh, society at large. And so he believed it was important for low-income black women, particularly, to learn how to survive in the private housing market. In the eyes of the congressional uh, leaders that were sitting on, particularly those who chair the housing and uh, Senate subcommittees on housing, Armstrong um, testimony riveted them. And particularly, I don't know if you all may remember, you all may remember um, Rick Lazio. He ran against Hillary Clinton the first time for the gubernatorial, for the uh, governor, I believe, or the, excuse Senate. me, Senate, 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 excuse me. So he asked Armstrong, um, to talk about how he got his residents to accept the quote-unquote stringent standards um, that he implemented, the stringent eviction and uh, casework standards. And he wanted to know if the national move was, uh, would be something that the rest of um, the public housing residents would accept. And Armstrong to that responded, yes, sir. I want to congratulate again your staff for the fine work they did in crafting this bill and introducing it. Because this bill will give us the flexibility we think is needed 
to continue to working with our residents to make them self-sufficient. Um, there's also another example that I probably will have to talk about in the Q&A, but I just want to briefly say that there was also representation from black male representation representing Section 8 housing. Um, his name was Abdul, uh, his name was Abdul, excuse me, um, Farrakhan, excuse me, and he represented Section 8, and he talked about how it was his role to make sure black people, black women understood that they were not supposed to stay in Section 8, and he t used black nationalism to justify why no one should, no black woman should even think about Section 8. Um, as he said in his congressional testimony, we have no desire to be on welfare as a community or as individuals. We are not standing on the shoulders of our ancestors begging for handouts. We're standing up as men who are former slaves who appreciate America. And then he proceeded to talk about how he selectively has worked with incarcerated men and helped them regain their moral and patriarchal authority of the households that um, subsidize households, Section 8 subsidized households. I'll pause there and I'll talk and hopefully in Q&A about the interracial dynamics of this, of how black men's voices were used and how white men justified their own patriarchal authority. Um, so my name is Joanna Kisniska. I'm from the Department of Biochemistry from the Medical Center. Every day I do biomedical research and I hope I not, I'm not gonna be one the one who speaks a language nobody understands, so I'll try to <laughs> make it really easy. <clears throat> and my talk will be a little bit different, so what we are studying is the effect of stress during pregnancy on, um, on the woman, but mostly on the, on the child. So when we think about pregnancy, that's what we like to imagine, like, but all too often it looks completely <laughs> different. Uh, for a variety of reasons. So uh, we are trying to determine what is the effect of that stress during pregnancy on the baby, okay? And how that, how that can occur. <clears throat> so when we think about stress, well, there are different reasons to be stressed. So we are working, there is workload, there could be some adverse uh, life events, different types of stressors that could be real stress like I don't know lion chasing us or something like that but then at the end of the day no matter what the stressor is the the effect on the body is very similar so we release a lot of hormones which we call stress mediators which will be basically floating in our blood so the question is what do they do what is the effect on the baby so what are those stress mediators? Some of them come from the nerves, and then one of them is adrenaline. Everybody probably heard about it. So when we are angry, when we are scared, this is where adrenaline is, adrenaline is released. And there's also cortisol. So this will be released when we are stressed for a long time. So those stress mediators will be basically floating in the blood of that mother. So does it affect the baby? So adrenaline itself does not go to the, does not go close to the placenta, will not affect directly the fetus, but <coughs> what it will do cause the vasoconstriction. So when we are very nervous then our blood, vein, blood um, vessels will constrict and then that also affects the uterine vessels and then the, basically the baby will have not enough oxygen or as cortisol to certain degree can actually go straight for the placenta. So the effect is that those, the fact that the baby is affected. So the question is, is it important? So actually it is because both the oxygen level and, and then uh, corticosterones, they are important regular, regulators of development. So if we disrupt that very tight balance, then we have problems with development of the baby. So from the, from the human studies, doesn't go forward. Okay. So from the human studies, there are a lot of studies focusing specifically on neurodevelopment of the child and then adults, uh, of, of the children of, this, of those stressed uh, mothers. So those babies are very often, they have lower birth weight, uh, the delivery is earlier, very often premature, and then in childhood that they have social and emotional problems, such as, uh, such as ADHD is more common, and in adulthood, 
there are the psychiatric disorders are more common in those children of stressed mothers such as autism, schizophrenia and others. So as you can see, this is all about the neuronal development, how the neurons develop. And this is what caught our attention because we are actually working on the cancer and we are working on a specific type of cancer which develops through children. So it's called neuroblastoma, but it's not a brain tumor. It develops from these neurons, sympathetic neurons in our body. So the sympathetic neurons are the very neurons which are actually activated during stress. So we wanted to, uh, to study this disease. And what is uh, very interesting about it, it develops very early, so sometimes <coughs> children are born with it. And it can be very different. Sometimes it's, it has very low risk, so it's easy to cure it. Sometimes it will go away, but sometimes it's very aggressive and it will still kill the children, and we don't know why it's so different. And then there's basically no established risk factors. The only factor we know is genetic predisposition, which is very, very rare. But also that doesn't explain everything. For example, this is a family tree, so every little piece here is one individual. And if it has this number, that means that it has this specific genetic predisposition. If it's white, the individual is healthy. If it's black, that means it has the disease. So if you can see that there are many members of that family who do have this genetic predisposition, but never develop the tumors. And some of them will develop the low grade tumors, which are not very harmful, but some of them will die of the disease. So that tells you that even though they have one very specific genetic change, it doesn't really mean everything. So there are some other factors which can contribute. So we thought about prenatal stress because we know that it affects neuronal development. So we, we are, and then neuro, this is why neuroblastoma develops. So we took the mice which are prone to develop neuroblastoma. And then uh, when the mothers were pregnant, we stressed them and we look at the children to see what is the frequency of the tumors and whether they are spreading like the aggressive disease. So this is what we basically saw that um, <clears throat> in, our, in offspring of our stressed mothers, we had 60% of, of this offspring had tumor, whereas control had 32. So basically we doubled the frequency of the tumor in the children of those stressed mothers. And then also we had more metastatic spread. So basically the tumor started to spread to all those different organs within the body. So this is the sign of very aggressive tumor. So what does it mean? Well, it, it really seems that the, 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 the stress, maternal stress during pregnancy um, it has an effect on, on, the, on the children more than probably we thought so. It definitely looks like it can promote neuroblastoma development, especially the, the high risk disease. Now the question is, can we prevent it? So yes, we can think about some a kind of pills which would block the stress pathways, but we know that it's not easy, especially in pregnant women. So what we probably should do is actually take a better care of our pregnant um, mothers and then um, try to basically um, provide a safe environment and then use some relaxation techniques which would relieve the effects of stress in general. So, and there are more questions. So if that affects neuroblastoma, the question is, does it affect other tumor types in, in children, maybe other tumor types in adults, and perhaps also other diseases. So basically that's what we are working on. And even though it took me five minutes to talk about it, but that's really very, a lot of hard work from <laughs> our poor students. And I try very hard not to stress them when they, when they, <laughs> when they do their work. Thank you to our panelists. So we've heard some of the negative effects about maternal stress and the physiological consequences. And if we think about that in terms of some of the other speakers' contributions, the illusion of black consent in black women. And if you were to then think about, well, those women may become pregnant, and then this cycle and the compounded intersectionality that Professor Hunter talked about, and maybe the inability to be heard and not having a chance to share those testimonies that Dr. Lance talked about. Um, maybe it is time for us to shut up and listen a little bit. 
And so on that note, we would love to hear from you all. What questions do you have for our esteemed panelists uh, to understand these nuances a little more and your own ideas? And we have a microphone. We're being videoed, so please wait for the microphone to ask your question. And if you feel comfortable sharing your name, that's great. And then your question. Hi, I'm Sawiko Colbert. I'm the chair of the Department of um, Performance Studies and a core faculty member in African American Studies. So thank you for your presentations. They were all wonderful and gave me a, a, a brief insight into the fabulous work that you're doing. So my question is for the last speaker. It seems like the work or research you're doing is ripe for a collaboration because my instinct would be, you can correct me on the science, but there are, um, it seemed like you were suggesting that long-term, like stress on an ongoing basis was a more of a precursor for the cancer than like um, a momentary stress. And so it seemed to me that the structures of impoverishment and some of the things that Rosemary is talking about in terms of housing for pregnant women, which are structured into our society and produce ongoing stress, um, would be something that you would need to address for women, not just sort of the momentary deep breathing for five minutes, but sort of the larger ways in which their whole life is exacerbated by structure. And so it seems to me that it's exciting to think about how your work intersects with maybe policy or some other questions that the other panelists mentioned. Absolutely. And, and, and as a matter of fact, I feel very limited in what we do because we only do the, the, you know, the animal work and we have really no resources to do any work on human population. So if we can think about any collaboration, that would be wonderful, especially that it's not on, so I was focusing on the, on the uh, stress during the pregnancy, but the truth is also there are some data showing that preconception stress before even baby is conceived, it has also very profound effect, uh, both in fathers and in mothers. So, so we really, I mean, we really need this, this resources from you guys who basically have access to those population to do some, you know, studies which would give the clinical relevance to what we are studying. So, thank you so much, but that's that's a great comment. Yes. Did we have another question? Thank you. Um, so I actually had a, a question that sort of bridges those your two papers as well. And and one of what sparked it for me was the 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 fact that we do a lot of research about pregnancy because we're worried about the baby that the woman is growing and we do less work on for the woman herself, right? And what those stress effects. So I'd be curious the extent to which you can figure out whether it's relevant to the studies you're doing, what the, the effects of the stress is on the woman. But it strikes me as bound up with something that you were talking about, which is at the policy level, the way in which the um, pr pregnant woman is a kind of symbolic of the um, a, a kind of national imperative that bypasses women themselves, right? And so that you get a lot of male politicians <laughs> speaking for the importance of the life that the pregnant woman is carrying, the health of the life that the pregnant woman is carrying, the et cetera, et cetera. Again, not so much about the life of the woman. And so it, it struck me that both of those things were in effect in those conversations. And I did have a question for you, Mark, and I'm sorry, I forgot it in the context of asking <laughs> my <laughs> first question. <laughs> Was that a question even? <laughs> Would you all like to comment? Yeah, I, that's a great question. Um, in my research, uh, in terms of finding the justification that um, men use to justify the patriarchal authority, oftentimes came through women. I mean, children, excuse me. So just as recently as the HUD the outgoing HUD secretary, Sean Donovan, would oftentimes use children as the 
um, medium through which to say that these uh, privatization um, schemes for housing policy would actually benefit the children first and then by um, association maybe the mother. Um, but the mother oftentimes is seen as someone who has to just willingly suffer in order to prove that she's truly a mother to her mm -hmm. children. Um, so if that means not having a good paying job, if that means having to move from place to place, um, hopefully maybe your child will be, the, be able to escape the, the impoverishment, structural impoverishment, probably through sports or some other type of form of service entertainment work. Um, and so I do think that that uh, use of children as a way of justifying continued inequities is oftentimes a political tactic that patriarchal, that patri um, housing officials use to demonstrate their patriarchal authority. Can I just mention that my, my colleague Rebecca Kukla has written quite a lot on the representation of women through discourses of motherhood and the way that this is used to distort science and politically marginalize and a bunch of great stuff, so I'll just mention that. Thank you. And yes, definitely, we, we should pay attention to the women. We don't do this study, but there are studies, aside from pregnancy, stress in pregnancy, but in general, effect of stress on different tumor types, and then we learn more and more how that can exacerbate the progression of the disease, for example, or can increase the risk of certain cancers. So there's definitely a link. I don't think anybody focused specifically on the time of pregnancy. Catherine Sandberg, Department of Medicine. So this has been a uh, wonderful panel, and I've really, really learned a lot. And my question is for Mark and uh, Rosemary, and so I'm kind of like a, Joanna, a basic scientist who mostly studies uh, mice and rats. <laughs> so, and I'm always trying to make sure that we are really dealing with, uh, you know, the human condition because we don't think of ourselves as uh, that interested in, in mice uh, and rats disease. So, Mark, what I, my question is, and so one of the things when we do, when, when Joanna and, and I do a, a study, uh, we're using, we, we know that if you take away uh, empowerment from the animal, then you, you cause stress. And, and with people, I, I assume this must also be true. So your project, Mark, does this, have you thought about actually seeing whether empowering individuals to tell their stories and to create this community and give them things that they can actually do to try to, you know, improve the situation. Do you think that that's actually give, reducing their level of stress? And then, and then Rosemary, is there, is there some possibility that uh, in, in these uh, uh, black women that something, you know, creating a project where they could speak and, and, and then have some more power through a sense of community, could that also uh, uh, serve to reduce the stress for them as well, or did did they yeah. speak? Yeah. Good did question. They try to speak? So, mm -hmm. well, really quickly. I mean, obviously, I don't have any studies on stress levels exactly, but suggestively, um, we spoke. One of the questions asked of each of these participants is, "What difference this event and this speaking makes to them?" And people uniformly talk about how incredibly important this is. We made a calls to a lot of these really young folks, these, these, these younger siblings of people whose, whose older siblings were killed by police, uh, the brother of Trayvon Martin, people like this. And almost every time that one of them was called, their immediate reaction was, why do you want to talk to me? Nobody ever wants to talk to me. That was the, sort of the initial kind of, kind of reaction. Like um, there is a lot of, there is a fair bit of sociological research, for example, in on, on, on the question of when discussions and dialogue and things like this make a lasting difference in people's social behavior, and it's always consistently when it's specifically tied to action items, to community, in, in, to further um, activist moves. That is to say, if you just sit a bunch of people down and they talk about this stuff, it doesn't do much for very long. If you sit them down and say, hey, we're going to have this project to change po policing in this way in this city, and we're going to combine that with talking to one another, then people report years later that this has changed them systematically. So it would be extremely surprising to me if it didn't have some effect on things like stress levels. But that would be a kind of sociologist, medical researcher 
co-project that I think could be really cool. Great. Um, yes, there are um, moments. Um, in which low-income black women activists uh, were invited to speak. And in my work, I talk about how um, oftentimes the conditions under which they spoke at the congressional level were very constrained. Um, and many times they were forced to tell, um, once again, uh, very half-truths in some ways. So oftentimes, um, low-income black women, the ones that I focused on in, in the congressional hearings, when they demanded additional research, uh, resources for public housing, they were quickly dismissed. But if they demanded, um, if they okayed the shift towards privatization and then po posited that shift based on some version of building economic, uh, giving a slice of the um, um, services, some of the service funding to black women, so giving the chance for black women to run the daycares or run um, some of the social services that are attached um, to public housing. Uh, black women who use those to try to basically say that they're going to advocate an entrepreneurial uh, response to, to the public housing reform, they ended up getting a little bit more attention. However, I talk about this, I bring this up in the context of austerity and disinvestment. So the constrained ways that black women had access to speaking to these congressional leaders oftentimes meant that they had to sometimes choke back or at least endure some of the um, very limited understandings about black women's poverty. Oftentimes thinking about black women's poverty as a personal choice and a cultural practice. Um, and so many ways um, low-income black women had to speak to these truths in order to seem legitimate and almost yep. create narratives based on that. So I talk about how in this moment of austerity and disinvestment that in order to enact the politics that we want and to get additional public housing resources, to push for a welfare state that is no longer punitive or patriarchal, you need to develop not only a, um, alternative narratives that are rooted in a radical vision, but also um, a clear analysis for why we continue to rely on these confessional narratives that do not, that reinscribe institutions and ideas of uh, patriarchy. Um, I think you've actually kind of answered my question. So I, I wanted to uh, think about the, the links between the, your uh, Mark and both of me, your, your presentations. Um, I was thinking about the challenge of, of it's one thing standing back and shutting up as academics, but how do we give up or give away or share the position of expert? So how do we move away from that name, comma, PhD, and name, comma, person who's going to tell a personal story, but will not be seen as being able to talk from an analytical perspective or an expert perspective? I think that's a, a, a tension that when we reify just telling personal truths rather than recognizing people as experts in their own communities more broadly and able to talk about structural uh, oppressions, um, then I don't know how, how you would answer that. And, well, it's hard, right? I mean, and, and, and sometimes you won't. I mean, sometimes you need to speak to a congressional committee and they're just not going to be interested in hearing some people and there'll be some immediate gains you can get through that. Then I think partly we have to think about is speaking to the Congressional Committee the, the method we want to use for social change in every case. There may be slower methods that nonetheless build capacity in communities that are different than that. But part of the answer is, is, is teaching, right? I mean, I invite everybody to, to watch that 10-minute documentary. This is on itstimetolisten.com. And it's an amazingly well done thing. There's three months of teaching sort of hidden behind that, that, that people did with these girls. They'd never like held a camera before in their lives, any of them. Um, so, you know, th these, these, these skills that we have at navigating bureaucracies and stuff aren't magic. We can teach people those things without being their spokesperson, I think. It's another. Um, I'm just gonna make a, a quick comment. Hi, I'm Emily Mendenhall, I'm a medical anthropologist um, 
uh, in the School of Foreign Service. And I just want to make a little comment because there's been um, a few comments that have dropped off linking systemic oppression um, to actually measuring it in the genes. And there's a pretty big and growing body of literature on this. Just wanted to share that um, on epigenetics and looking at historical trauma and systemic mm -hmm. oppression, um, sexism, racism, classism, all over uh, becomes embodied actually through methylation at the cellular level. And this is really provocative work. If anyone wants to talk about it, um, some leading scholars are like Chris Kuzawa, mostly biological anthropologists, but also working within physiology itself. And it's a really interesting and provocative literature if people um, are interested in doing that work here. Thank you. Gwen Michael, Anthropology and African Studies. Uh, Rosemary, thank you. I really appreciated the link between your, uh, yours and, and Joanna's. I had a question about the title you gave it. You called it Faux Heads of Households. Mm -hmm. And I wondered if you would talk a little bit about why <laughs> you've described it that way. Um, thank you for that question. Um, essentially, in the, what, I, what I'm arguing is the interracial um, uh, male dynamics of the housing congressional hearings, um, black men were metaphorically in, in some ways lifted up to act as the stand-ins for these heads of households for black women. So by talking about how they have spoke, they have a base of low-income black women who wholeheartedly agree with their leadership, they are oftentimes um, trying to enact this um, politic that I, it's tied back to republicanism and this history of um, men standing in to be able to represent the interests of the entire household. And so in this case, it would be black men standing in to represent the interests of black women. Um, during a time of disinvestment. Married or unmarried? Unmarried. unmarried. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but they are often married, because that's also part of that performance of saying, I know how to model the correct way. Um, and in some ways, I think that that's the ideological but tenuous alliance between the white men and the black men. Um, they were able to posit that this, through this um, enactment of gendered authority, um, privileged authority, they were able to say, oh, well, you're doing it right, and so I'm going to speak to you. And it's some, I'm going to be developing this in my book, but it's the way of how we're living Monaghan politics today. Um, mm -hmm. I'd like us to um, end with another round of applause for our panelists. And I'm so excited about the ideas and the deeper questions and the possibilities for collaboration across all of these fabulous disciplines and perspectives. So please keep those ideas percolating. Send them to the Gender Justice Initiative at georgetown.edu. <laughs> Gender Justice at georgetown.edu so we can capture those ideas and build on future programs and potential opportunities for looking at that together. So thank you.